First of all, I would like to apologise to everyone for not being able to deliver this lecture in person, in which I have entitled An International Journey in Search of the Etiology of Zinc Deficiency. I would like first to acknowledge the tremendous support and encouragement that I have received throughout this journey from Dr. Michael Hambridge and my fellow iZinc colleagues, all of whom have given freely their advice and expertise. This first slide describes zinc deficiency for the first time in many studies in which we studied in our laboratory, starting with Canada in 1981-1987 and finishing in Brazil in 2012. Why are we concerned about zinc deficiency? This slide classifies the three adverse health consequences of zinc deficiency impaired growth, impaired immune competence, and adverse pregnancy outcomes. In this slide, we present the prevalence of low serum zinc concentrations among pregnant women and young children studied in our laboratory. The red line indicates the trigger level set by iZinc, above which there is public health concern. And we can clearly see here that among pregnant women, in Ethiopia and Malawi, there's a very high prevalence of zinc deficiency compared to Canadian counterparts. Among the young children, we have again very high prevalence in Cambodia, Mongolia and Zambia. But even in New Zealand, 23% of the young children have low serum zinc concentrations. What are the factors associated with the etiology of zinc deficiency? We can classify these into three groups inadequate zinc intakes, high physiological requirements, and excessive losses, or a combination of these factors. We can further subdivide the inadequate intakes into low zinc intakes per se, or poor bioavailability. In order to assess the adequacy of zinc intakes, it was necessary to analyze the zinc, the phytate, a potent inhibitor of zinc absorption, and the phytate-zinc molar ratios of plant-based staples in the countries where we were working. This slide presents the data on the zinc, the phytate, and the phytate-zinc molar ratios. Note the very high zinc content of unrefined maize compared to refined maize, but this is also accompanied by a very high content of phytate resulting in a markedly high phytate-zinc molar ratio. Notice the very high phytate-zinc molar ratios in legumes and oil seeds compared to the much lower ratios in starchy tubers and roots, particularly sago, the staple plant-based staple in Papua New Guinea, and NSET, the staple in the Sudama region of Ethiopia but note also the negligible amount of zinc in these starchy roots and tubers. We use these data to calculate the zinc, phytate and phytate-zinc molar ratios of indigenous recipes for complementary foods. In this slide, we can see the zinc, the phytate and the phytate-zinc molar ratio of the national complementary food consumed in Malawi based on unrefined maize and soya bean. Note the very high phytate-zinc molar ratio of this national complementary food. Compare this with the much lower phytate-zinc molar ratio of sweet potato and pumpkin leaf complementary food and another complementary food based on sago flour, wheat flour and sugar consumed in Papua New Guinea but note again the very low zinc content of this sago flour complementary food. In order to assess the adequacy of the zinc intakes, it was necessary to develop a dietary manual to assess zinc intakes in low-income countries. In 1999, we published a dietary manual entitled An Interactive 24-Hour Recall for assessing the adequacy of iron and zinc intakes in developing countries. This dietary manual was revised and produced by Harvest Plus in 2005. 
we use this dietary method in conjunction with our food composition table data to calculate the zinc, the phytate, and the phytate-zinc molar ratios of children's diets in several low-income countries. The phytate-zinc molar ratio was proposed by Obelius and Harland as a method of the likelihood of poor bioavailability of zinc in diets. Ratios above 15 were considered to be indicative of low zinc bioavailability. We can clearly see from these data that in the children's diets from Mexico, Kenya and Malawi that are based predominantly on maize, we have very high phytate zinc molar ratios. The data from Mexico and Kenya were generated from the Nutrition CRISP study and our data is from Malawi. We then compare this with the rice-based diets of Northeast Thailand and Cambodia, where we can see markedly lower phytate zinc molar ratios. We also used our dietary assessment method to assess the major food sources of zinc. This slide presents the data for non-breastfed children and compares the sources from Mongolia, Cambodia, Malawi and Ghana with data generated by Ken Brown and colleagues for US infants and toddlers. It's clear from these data that the major source of zinc for the children's diets from low-income countries is indeed from cereals, whereas in the US, for infants, it's dairy, and for the older toddlers, it's a mixture of dairy and meat. Stable isotope studies by Dr. Michael Hambridge and colleagues have emphasized that the potent inhibitory effect of phytate on zinc absorption is much greater in adults than previously suspected. We can see from this slide that if we have a diet containing 1,000 milligrams of phytate a day, then the total amount of zinc needed to meet the physiological requirement of zinc for a male doubles from 9 milligrams to 18 milligrams a day. To date, we have rather limited data on children, but it's of interest that in the diets of children from Mexico and Malawi, their intake of phytate can be as high as 2,000 milligrams. In order to evaluate the prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc, we first used the probability approach developed by George Beaton here as early as the 1970s to calculate the prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc in Malawi and Ghana. The probability approach was also used by Suzanne Murphy and colleagues to calculate the prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc from Mexico, Kenya and Egypt in the Nutrition CRISP study. Later, we adopted the EAR cut point method, which again was developed by George Beaton in the 1990s to evaluate the prevalence of inadequate intakes of children from Australasia and Canada. Note again, if we apply the iZinc trigger level, that it's the children in low income countries that have a very high prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc. WHO, IAEA, UNICEF and iZinc endorsed the use of a dietary indicator based on the prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc to assess the risk of population zinc status. Ken Brown, the chair of iZinc, was responsible for implementing an iZinc technical brief that was published in 2007. This technical brief outlined the steps needed to assess the prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc. We can use this indicator to identify populations at high risk of zinc deficiency and also to evaluate food-based interventions, whether they're from dietary diversification and modification, fortification or biofortification. This slide applies this dietary indicator to assess the risk of population zinc deficiency based on the prevalence of inadequate zinc intakes. 
If we look at the green bars, we can see that children in Malawi, Mexico and Kenya have a very high prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc associated with poor bioavailability of zinc because of their maize-based diets. In contrast, the high prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc in Northeast Thailand is associated with the low zinc content of the soil and thus the low zinc content of the rice-based staple. Whereas in Ethiopia, the high prevalence among the pregnant women in Sudama is associated with their staple NSET, which is very low in zinc. Notice the lower prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc among the children in Egypt, whose major staple is leavened wheat bread. And during the leavening process, phytate is hydrolyzed to the lower inositol phosphates that no longer inhibit zinc absorption. This slide summarizes the interventions that we can use to combat zinc deficiency and other micronutrients. Supplementation, dietary diversification and modification, fortification and biofortification. We have focused on food-based strategies, particularly initially dietary diversification and modification. This is defined as changes in food production food selection patterns and traditional household methods for preparing and processing indigenous foods. Why did we select dietary diversification and modification for our strategy in rural Malawi? This strategy can enhance the micronutrient status of entire households and across generations. It's community-based and it can empower the community to help themselves. It prevents coexisting micronutrient interaction deficiencies with no risk of antagonistic interactions. It can be designed to be culturally acceptable, equitable, sustainable and safe, with minimal inputs once behaviour change has been achieved. And finally, we can improve the micronutrient status and health by several pathways, including income generation. We have experience with dietary diversification and modification in three projects. Two of those were conducted in rural Malawi. The first one on children between three and seven years of age. It was a 12 month study and the second on infants and toddlers aged six to 23 months. This was a three month study. In both cases, these were quasi experimental design studies. The third study was undertaken on Filipino infants and toddlers in which we used our DDM strategies to modify the complementary feeding recipes. This slide presents our rationale for choosing dietary diversification modification as our intervention in rural Malawi. As I've mentioned earlier, the staple diets in, Ma in Malawi are maize based and in the rural areas, as much as 50% of the energy can come from this single staple. As a result, the diets are very high in phytic acid. There's a low intake of animal source foods in the rural areas, only between three and 7% of the energy coming from animal foods. There's a high prevalence of stunting and anemia. And in certain regions of Malawi, there exists vitamin A and iodine deficiency. The first strategies that we developed were strategies to reduce the content of phytate in the maize-based staples. These were first developed in our laboratory. We concentrated on three strategies, soaking, fermentation and germination. Soaking was used because phytate is water soluble and 50% of the phytate can be lost by simply soaking maize flour. Fermentation, and germination were used because during these processes, the phytate becomes hydrolyzed to the lower inositol phosphates via the phytase enzyme. On the right, we have a photograph 
of the household method developed by Christine Hotz that could be used by rural mothers for soaking the maize. This application reduced the phytate content of the maize-based porridges by 50%. We also adopted other dietary diversification and modification strategies in Malawi, besides our phytate reducing strategies. We encouraged the in intake of animal source foods to increase the dietary content of fat, available zinc, available iron, vitamin B12, vitamin A and niacin. We increased the production and intake of pro-vitamin A and vitamin C by giving out papaya seedlings and also the production and intake of micronutrient-rich plants such as pigeon peas. For the infants and young children, we promoted exclusive breastfeeding up to six months of age and then safe and appropriate complementary foods from six months and continued breastfeeding to at least two years. These strategies were all performed in conjunction with other public health strategies, such as hygiene and also safe um, complementary foods. Our strategies were adopted using social marketing. Drama was used. Plays were given about the project messages and songs were composed by village bands. This slide summarises the efficacy of our dietary diversification strategies that we used on the Malawian children. On the left, we have the prevalence of inadequate intakes. The green are the control group and the blue bars are the intervention group. We can clearly see that at the end of our 12-month intervention, we have a markedly lower prevalence of inadequate intakes of zinc, calcium, vitamin B12 and protein compared to the control group. Note that there was no difference in the prevalence of inadequate intakes of iron. This was because the major source of animal source foods in this region of Malawi was fish because we were working near Lake Malawi rather than meat. There was also an impact on other outcomes. The intervention compared to the control group had more diverse diets, which were of higher quality. There was a lower prevalence of anemia, lower morbidity to childhood illnesses, such as acute respiratory infection and diarrhea, a greater muscle mass, as indicated by anthropometry, but no effect on growth. This slide depicts the efficacy of our integrated dietary diversification modification with nutrition education and behaviour change in a study in infants in rural Malawi. On the left, we have the percentage of households adopting our DDM strategies. Again, the intervention is in the, in the blue bars and the control in the green bars. And we can see that more households in the intervention group adopted enriching the porridges or pala. More households in our intervention group used thick pala prepared from 16% dry matter instead of 6 or 7% dry matter, incorporated legumes and animal foods in the complementary foods fed to the children. On the right, we have the adequacy of the mean intakes as a percent of the WHO estimated needs. Again, we can see that there's a higher intake of energy, calcium, iron and zinc in our intervention compared to our control group at the end of the study. But nevertheless, at no time do the intakes meet the WHO estimated needs of 100% suggesting that in this particular setting, additional strategies, perhaps such as fortification at the household level, are needed in order to meet the WHO estimated needs. Based on our experience of our dietary diversification modification studies, we came up with some recommendations for programmes. First, 
we encourage programs to include context-specific strategies which are developed and implemented using particip participatory research processes. Second, to promote the consumption of animal source foods. Third, to ensure that the behaviour change communication is indeed effective. Fourth, to integrate the dietary diversification modification strategies together with public health strategies. Also to optimise the design and duration of the dietary diversification modification by adopting programme theory to evaluate impact. And finally, to integrate the dietary diversification modification with programmes addressing the underlying causes of malnutrition, such as poverty alleviation, food security and income generation. What about our experiences with fortification? We have three experiences that I would like to share with you. Our first experience was performed in North East Thailand in collaboration with the Institute of Nutrition in Mahadol University. This involved fortification of a seasoning powder and was conducted on primary school children in 10 schools. It was a randomised controlled efficacy study. The second was a study in Zambia undertaken with the University of Zambia, the Institute of Child Health and the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. This involved fortification of a locally produced complementary food for infants and young children with and without HIV. Again, it was a randomised controlled efficacy study. More recently, our study in Cambodia has been an effectiveness study. This was performed in collaboration with the National Nutrition Programme in Cambodia, WHO, A to Z, USAID and GAIN. It involved household fortification of complementary foods with micronutrient powders, commonly called sprinkles, plus infant and young child feeding education compared with infant and young child feeding education alone and was performed in one district. This slide summarises some of the results of our fortification study on seasoning powder in northeast Thailand. The seasoning powder was fortified with or without four micronutrients, zinc, iron, vitamin A and iodine. The seasoning powder was mixed in the school lunch to 580 children from 10 low SES schools for 31 weeks. In terms of the results, we found that our intervention children had a significant increase in haemoglobin, which was our primary outcome, a significant decrease in the prevalence of zinc and iodine deficiencies based on low serum zinc concentrations and low urinary iodine concentrations, and a significant decrease in the incidence and symptoms of respiratory illnesses. We also showed a significantly higher cognitive scores based on our visual recall test, but no effect on growth. What about our study of the cereal-based complementary food in Zambia? This study was undertaken on infants recruited from Lusaka aged six months of age. The infants received either a richly fortified porridge or a basil fortified porridge for 12 months. This figure on the left shows the results of the biomarkers. What we can clearly see here is a significant reduction in the prevalence of anemia, iron deficiency, and to a lesser extent, vitamin A deficiency in those infants receiving the richly fortified porridge compared to those receiving the basal fortified porridge. Note there was no significant difference in the prevalence of zinc deficiency in the two groups at the end of the study, and there was no significant difference found in growth. <laughs> 
This slide summarizes the results of the fortification study in Cambodia using sprinkles. This, as I've mentioned, is was an effectiveness study. This time, the infants were recruited six months of age in one district in Cambodia and received the sprinkles plus infant and young child feeding education for six months, whereas the control group received the infant and young child feeding education alone. Again, we can see a significant reduction in the prevalence of anemia and iron deficiency in those infants who received the education plus the sprinkles compared to those children receiving the infant and young child feeding education alone. Note we showed no difference in the prevalence of zinc deficiency, although we did see an increase in mean serum zinc concentrations. Likewise, we showed no difference in the prevalence of vitamin A deficiency or in growth. These infants were followed at 12, 18 and 24 months of age. We noted that anemia and zinc effects did not persist beyond the six month intervention period. This slide examines the adequacy of micronutrient intakes from complementary foods. On the left, we see intakes by infants consuming unfortified complementary foods based on dietary data collected using our dietary method. Note that for children in the developing countries, such as Indonesia, the Philippines, Mongolia and Cambodia, again, that the mean intakes of iron, zinc and calcium do not meet the WHO estimated needs. By comparison, the New Zealand infants, their intakes of zinc and calcium meet the WHO estimated needs, whereas their iron intake is just below the estimated needs. What happens when you feed these infants fortified complementary foods? To answer this question, we obtained samples of fortified complementary foods available in the marketplace for many low-income countries. In this particular figure, we compare the intakes of these complementary foods based on 40 grams of the fortified complementary food consumed. If we examine the rice flour, the brown rice, and the complementary foods based on cereals and legumes, assuming this 40 grams was consumed, again we see the same picture, that indeed the intakes still do not meet the WHO estimated needs for these three problem micronutrients, iron, zinc and calcium, emphasising that we need to revisit the levels that are currently being added to these fortified complementary foods available in the marketplace. And finally, our experiences with biofortification. In Uganda, we were involved in training research assistants to assess the pro-vitamin A carotenoid intakes using our interactive 24-hour recall method that we developed for a Harvest Plus efficacy study where they compared the efficacy of orange flesh sweet potato with white sweet potato. We've also been involved in a study in Malawi in association with the University of Malawi, the British Geological Survey, the University of Nottingham and the University of East Anglia. In this pilot study, we aim to assess the potential for using selenium fertilizer on selenium intakes and status of women and preschool children in Malawi who are living in districts where the selenium level in the soil is very low. So finally, what are our challenges for zinc research in the future? We need to develop sensitive and specific biomarkers of zinc status that are suitable for the assessment of individuals. We need to include phytate values in all food composition data. We need to support and encourage low-income countries 
to include dietary and biomarkers of zinc status in all micronutrient studies and in national nutrition surveys. We need to include baseline data on zinc and phytate intakes and, phyt and zinc biomarkers in all zinc interventions in the future. And we need to understand why zinc fortification does not produce consistently a positive response in zinc biomarkers. And finally, we need to investigate coexisting micronutrient deficiencies and host-related factors as predictors of zinc status. Finally, I would like to acknowledge and extend my thanks to the numerous college, colleagues that I've had the privilege of working with throughout this journey, starting initially with Dr. Peter Hayward in the Papua New Guinean Institute of Medical Research, and then Dr. Noel Solomons in CESIAM, and finishing with Dr. Michael Hambridge, Dr. Yuelso Abeba, and Dr. Barbara Stocker from the University of Havoasa in Southern Ethiopia, and the Universities of Colorado and Oklahoma. I would like to conclude by acknowledging the important contributions of many talented, talented graduate students, some of whom are shown here, who have assisted with this research, often under very rigorous circumstances. And without their important contributions, this journey would not have been completed. And finally, I would like to thank my audience for listening to this presentation. Thank you. <laughs>